Our conversation today is co-sponsored by the WVU Humanities Center, the Appalachian Justice Initiative here at the WVU College of Law and the Reed College of Media. And we wanna thank all three of those institutions for bringing us together for this conversation about solutions for our region. We're gonna introduce you today to Tom Hansel, who's the creator of this documentary, After Coal. But we're gonna start with a couple of words from the Dean here at the College of Law, Gregory Bowman. Thank you, Ashton, and thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful turnout for a wonderful event. Uh, Tom Hansel's book, After Coal, uh, published by the West Virginia University Press, is a wonderful example uh, of the kind of work that our land-grant university press does and the kind of work that it supports uh, to support authors and to educate, uh, to celebrate and improve our state uh, and our people. So the book has gotten great reviews. Um, we have uh, some excerpts, uh, one excerpt in particular that I'd like to read about the book. Um, one review said that after coal focuses on coal field residents who chose not to leave but instead remained in their communities. It tells the story of four decades of exchange between two mining communities on opposite sides of the Atlantic. And indeed, I went to school for a year in England uh, down in Devon and had the chance to travel to Wales. And it is a place that in many ways resembles our, our home state. Uh, so this is, I think, a, a, a profoundly important piece of work. And um, it's been called visually appealing, uh, deeply moving. Uh, it brings the reader face to face with Appalachian and Welsh coal miners whose stories touch the reader's heart. Uh, and it's a book that is necessary to help move our region forward. So very important, uh, very moving. And I want to thank some of the people who are helping put this together today. Um, my colleague Bob Bastris sitting there in the third row, who really spearheaded this effort for our Appalachian Justice Initiative here at the College of Law. My colleague Nick Stump in the front row, who will be speaking. The Reed College of Media, uh, whose Dean Marianne Reed is here today the Humanities Center at WVU for co-sponsoring the um, today's event along with the College of Law and WVU Press. My colleague, uh, Lisa Brugnoli in the back, who always gets embarrassed when I point her out, but she is instrumental to our success and our wonderful events here. Um, Katie Coyne from the Charleston Gazette Mail, Ashton Mara, and um, most importantly, um, Tom Hansel for having the vision and dedication to engage in this project. So thank you all for being here. Um, we look forward to it and let's get started. So I promise that you're going to get to meet Tom here in a few minutes. <laughs> but first, I want to say that you know the inspiration from this for this event comes from his work, um, his documentary After Call: Stories of Survival in Appalachia and Wales, profiles inspiring individuals who are building a new future in the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky and of South Wales. It was turned into then the book by WVU Press, and since its release has been used as the basis of community conversations all across the region um, about what comes next for those cities and the towns that have been so heavily reliant on the industry. So this afternoon, we're gonna discuss some of those same issues with a panel of people who've spent time on the ground in these communities, doing research, uh, doing reporting, sharing our stories. During that time, we also want to hear from you. So this is your first warning. Please keep note of the things you'd like to ask, the input you'd like to have in this conversation. We'd really like you to be a part of it. First, we're going to begin with learning more about the book and the documentary themselves and the man who created them. Tom Hansel is an award-winning filmmaker and installation artist who lives and works in the Appalachian Mountains. Hansel's documentary films have been broadcast nationally on public television and have screened at international film festivals. His installations have appeared in galleries from California to Vermont. He's the recipient of grants and fellowships from the Kentucky Arts Council, the Headland Center for the Arts, the Southern Humanities Media Fund, and the National Endowment for the Arts. And Tom says, I make media and sculpture rooted in my mountain environment. My projects connect the specific challenges faced by rural Appalachian mountain communities with the universal challenge all humans face as we strive to live in harmony with nature and each other. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Tom Hansel. Right. Well, thank you. I'm 
really humbled after hearing all of those words. I'm sort of like, we should just let everyone else come up and <laughs> talk about how good this project is and then, uh, and then go off and, and have another conversation. Um, so I do appreciate everybody coming out and uh, especially, especially appreciate um, all the sponsors, the College of Law, the West Virginia Humanities Center, the Reed College of, of Media and 100 Days in Appalachia, and of course, West Virginia University Press for, um, for really believing in this project and, and seeing how it can, can make a difference. So I guess what I should do is back up for a second, and you all have heard all these wonderful things about, about After Coal, but it's not just a book and a documentary. So the documentary came out in 2016. It's been on West Virginia Public Television. It actually premiered at the West Virginia International Film Festival in Charleston um, and been shown around the world as well. But, um, but it's really, most importantly, I think, an exchange project and a community conversation project. So throughout the process of making the film, we had people from primarily coal fields of eastern Kentucky go to South Wales. We had people from Wales come to Kentucky. We had public forums, newspaper reports. And the idea is to continue these conversations about what makes healthy communities, how to adapt to changes in our economy, how to be true to ourselves and our cultures um, while dealing with all those things. So I hope that you'll continue this conversation because that's the idea. The book is not a prescription. If you read the book and you think you're going to get all the answers, you might be a little disappointed or watch the film. It's more about uh, providing examples of people who figured out ways to survive and sparking conversations about how we can use those examples in our own local community. So I really do want to hear from you all about work that's, because I know there's a lot of great work going on and would love to hear more about that. Um, so what I will do is share a sh short passage from the book and short clip from the film and then really want to continue this conversation. So we have a formal panel going and then we'll open it up to the, the audience. Oh, one, one final thing I want to say before, uh, before I dive into the book is you'll hear me use the term just transition a lot, that that's kind of the underlying principle of the whole After Coal project, the book and the documentary and the exchange. And that's one of those slippery words. You know, culture is also kind of a slippery word and sustainability and those, they can mean different things depending on who's using them. So I wanted to just take a second and let you all know what I mean when I use this term just transition, because it's going to connect to a lot of what we talk about in the panel too. Um, and this is a definition that comes from the Climate Justice Alliance, a coalition of grassroots groups doing work. It includes people from the Appalachians as well as from Native American communities, um, people from African American communities, people from Alaska. Um, so they, Climate Justice Alliance defines just transition as, quote, a place-based set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. If the process of transition is not just, then the outcome never will be. So I want to keep that in mind. And I guess the other thing to keep in mind that I should say is that this whole exchange between Appalachia and Wales was not my idea. Um, I'm really standing on the shoulder of giants here, particularly uh, John Gaventa and Helen Lewis, who are working through the Highlander Center in East Tennessee. They connected with Hal Francis, who was at the South Wales Miners Library in Swansea, uh, Wales, during the 1970s. And they actually started a rank and file, an exchange of rank and, rank and file union miners. Um, they were actually both on strike. There were big coal strikes in 1974, both in central Appalachia, Harlan County, and um, as well as in South Wales. And so they built on this exchange. There was actually a delegation of Welsh miners that came to West Virginia in 1979. And that was connecting both Highlander Center, uh, South Wales Miners Library, and uh, Southern Appalachian Labor School in Oak Hill, West Virginia, was one of the sponsors on that. Um, so what I'm doing really builds on that. Uh, Helen Lewis turned all of her archives over to Appalachian State University, which is where I am now. I uh, am at Boone, North Carolina, teaching at App State. And, um, and it was really those archives that Helen had turned over to us and, and her and John Gaventa's work that sparked this. So the project would not happen without them, nor without Pat Beaver, who was the director of the Center for Appalachian Studies and a co-producer on the project. So need to give them a big credit before I dive into to the reading. 
So that helps explain, I guess, the how, but a lot of people just ask why. You know, where, why, why would one think about connecting Appalachia and Wales? And so I'll just start by sharing a little section of the introduction of the, of the book. And the title is called The Most Difficult Question. EPA, Expanding Poverty in America. This statement is written in three foot high letters on a banner stretched over a bandstand in a public park in Pikeville, Kentucky. It's June 2012, and I'm just starting production of the After Coal documentary. The crowd around me is dressed in the reflective stripes of mining uniforms or in t-shirts, reading Friends of Coal and Walker Heavy Machinery. I'm documenting a coal industry sponsored pep rally before a public hearing on new water quality regulations proposed for mountaintop removal coal mines. The speaker on stage is speaking proudly of his family's heritage in the coal industry. He concludes his passionate statement with the question, if we can't mine coal, what are we going to do in Eastern Kentucky? It's a good question. As a filmmaker who spent most of my career living and working in the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky, documenting mining issues, it's an important and yet very difficult question to answer. My earlier documentaries, The Coal Bucket Outlaw and Electricity Ferry, were intended to start civil conversations between workers in the coal industry and other community members about a shared vision of good jobs, clean air, clean water, and a safe working environment. However, the conversations almost always broke down as soon as someone pointed out the obvious. The coal industry had long been the only model for economic development in central Appalachia. More examples of what life after coal might look like were desperately needed to move the conversation forward. As I struggled with the haunting question of, if we can't mine coal, what are we going to do? The image of Welsh villages rising from the ashes left by the coal industry captured my imagination. I thought if I could just learn a few details about how the Welsh communities made the transition, then I could identify specific solutions to help coal communities in Appalachia. However, I quickly learned the secret to life after coal was not that simple. The process of creating the after coal documentary took more than five years. And during that time, I learned to stop looking for concrete solutions and start supporting ongoing conversations about how to create healthy communities in former mining regions. International efforts to address climate change make this challenge especially intense for coal producing regions. As our economy shifts from fossil fuels, how can we ensure that places where fossil fuels were extracted do not continue to bear an unfair share of the cost of extraction? I believe there's as many solutions for life after coal as there are residents of mining communities. And I hope that these stories from South Wales and Central Appalachia will inspire people to discover solutions that work in their home communities. So with that, I'd like to share just a short clip from the documentary. This is actually a condensed version, about seven minutes provides a little bit of background of this exchange, and then uh, provides a specific example of a group in Harlan County that's using the arts to, to regenerate their community. This is just one of a half a dozen examples that are in the film, and more than a dozen examples that are in the book. And then I'll uh, talk very briefly about some similarities and differences I noticed, and we'll, we'll move into the panel. So this is a, a clip from the documentary After Cole. I'm looking for the stone hewed out of the mountain. I'm looking for the stone come rolling down from Babylon. I'm looking for the stone hewed out of the mountain, tearing down the kingdom of this world. Tearing down, oh, tearing down the kingdom of this world. In the southeast of the United States, the central Appalachian coal fields lie beneath rugged mountains. Most of the towns in southern West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, and far southwestern Virginia were built exclusively to extract coal. The steady loss of coal jobs over three decades has left these mountain communities sparsely populated. I'm a third generation coal miner. My uh, grandfather helped start this mine here for uh, United States Steel back in 1917. It was part of my past and it's part of my present, but I don't see it being part of my future or my grandchildren's future.
Wales is located to the west of England in the United Kingdom. The coalfields lie in the valleys of South Wales. Historically, this region was considered the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Dramatic job loss in the 1980s means that Wales has had three decades to adjust to a new economy. When you look at this site now, you see it, it looks nice, it's lovely and green. It's, it's beautiful on a beautiful sunny day like this. But what we have to remember is that so much of this community depended upon this mine and others like it for their living. When the mines closed, there was nothing put in its place. That is the problem, nothing put in its place. Both South Wales and Central Appalachia were once the heart of booming industrial regions. Now, residents are working to find their way through a post-industrial landscape. To everybody, my name's Carl Shoup. Welcome to Eastern Kentucky. I'm just proud to have you aboard here. Now, it looks to me as if the history of the coal industry in Kentucky has followed the same lines as the coal industry in Wales. It's You've it's all had a hard time and... It's happening, it's been, happening. ...been fighting for every little thing you ever had. It's still, it's still a battle, Terry. You know, you think when you get older and you retire and stuff, but there's no rest. The latest crisis, the latest economic crisis is a financial crisis caused by the bankers, caused by greed of the bankers. But who's paying the price for that again? Yeah, it is people in communities such as this who are paying the price for that. The only people who are going to save this community are the people in the community. What you struggle with in Appalachia, we struggle here in South Wales. How do we actually control our own destiny? Uh, how can we achieve sustainable economic development for the benefit of local communities? While boom and bust cycles turn many mining towns into ghost towns, residents of the mountains of Appalachia and the valleys of South Wales fought to survive after coal markets went bust. In both regions, a new set of leaders emerged. The miners' strike was a catalyst for Dev and all its developments. Big decision makers always seem to be the men. They run the clubs. They're obviously very active in the miners' union. The role of women was quite invisible. There was a group of women that um, got very active picketing. And so my, my interest was the legacy of the strike. And I didn't want it just to be, oh, women would be just doing the cooking, the cleaning, you know. I wanted something more. I wanted it to last. We thought that perhaps if we set up a little group of women that could produce something that make money, and then we thought, well, if we're going to set up a small business, we've got to learn business skills. So we thought, well, perhaps we better do some sort of training courses for women, start there. So that's how it started. <laughs> we've just had £250,000 just under to run a um, mental health project. But mental health in the nature of people with anxiety, depression, stress, because we recognise in poverty brings all these things. And um, we just felt sort of push to do something because we had a lot of young men who suicides in our communities. So we just wanted to try and make a bit of a difference, really. I grew up in Crainant, um, small, one of the smaller communities in the Dillard Valley. My father was a coal miner. I came back to this valley in 86. Not for one minute thinking I'm going to go work in my valley. And then one day I was in the local library, I was volunteering in the local library, and somebody said, you've got to come to the workshop with me. They're doing great work up there. They've got great courses on. Come with me. So I came to that, and really, from that point on, I haven't been home. <laughs> we came to recognise that the work that we, we were doing, whether we perhaps it wasn't even intentional, was helping the economy, helping to regenerate a community. People say to me all the time, you know, yeah, but what's in the Delight Valley? Well, I don't know what it is, but... There's a sort of community here. 
I think the reason why Dev's been so successful is we're a bottom-up organisation. We respond to the needs of the people in the community. We're not top-down, so we don't impose anything. It all comes from the community, from the grassroots. Letcher County, Kentucky, coal miner Shane Lucas turned to farming after he was laid off from the mines. How many years did you end up working in the mines? About 17, 18 years. I know that they was laid off, you know, coal was getting bad. And I know that I had to do something to make a dollar. So I was like, I want to do vegetables. And uh, I started selling on the side of the road and go get me a load and have me a storage building out here. And I'd sell on the side of the roads. Then I got a little bit bigger and I said, well, it's easier to have my little store here at the house and I can still work in my garden while I sell out of my store. Well, about one way, about 40, 41 pounds. It's the biggest one I got, I think. Heck yeah, and you're selling that for eight dollars? Yeah. Got a little small apple orchard growing here. Hopefully in about two or three years, I can start selling apples getting them produced. Uh, I've got 20 rows of peas through here now. Starting on my vegetables, uh, tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, cucumbers, cabbage. I've got about 250 tomato plants in here. I hope within the next three to four weeks, I'll be gathering tomatoes out of. This is a roof boat. This is what they boat the top with, keep from rock fall. I, I'd like to have enough to do my whole garden, but I do about 90% of it in roof boats now. Don't ever have to worry about them rotting. That's the only way to go. <laughs> Two years ago, I had the best job I ever had in my life. Best job I ever have in my life. Probably be the best job that you go anywhere in the United States and get. And it went down. Coal mining's pretty well out. So I'm gonna try to do my best at farming, see what I can do with it. sometimes think that we are living in a period of after coal, you know, that coal mining has come and gone. I would challenge that view. The lights that are, that are lighting us here now, the electricity coming to power those lights is coming from Abathor power station, which is coal fired. Um, that coal is coming in the main from um, Russia, from Colombia, from parts of the States, from China, we don't supply enough coal to meet the demand in, in Wales or indeed the UK. So we import a huge amount of coal every year. We must be sympathetic to international links that are based upon fellowship and mutualism and cooperation, not upon exploiting indigenous peoples or exploiting uh, resources in other parts of the world for the benefit of uh, uh, multinational companies. Thanks. 
Yeah. Thanks. So that's just a, a snippet of one, one of the stories. And I, I really did that quote the woman just said, is, I think bears repeating, because I think it underlies a lot of the, the spirit of After Coal is she says, I am more than just a rock in the ground, and so is this place. Um, and so I guess, uh, you know, some of the question is, what do we do next? And again, I'm very interested in hearing some of your, your thoughts about that and talking with the panelists. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about similarities and differences, because I think that helps, helps lay some of this groundwork for this conversation. Um, and it's also the first question people ask after watching the film, too. <laughs> um, so the similarities you might have noticed, and in, in fact was referenced in the introduction, is you really see a similar geography in both places. Tightly packed hills, narrow valleys, villages built along the valleys to house the miners. Um, and I think you get a little bit of the sense, but there's a, a section in the film that really talks about the idea of community spirit tight-knit communities. They're not just houses packed in together, but people have connections. And, um, and traditions like singing together and making music together that help strengthen those community bonds and, and provide a foundation. So, we, um, so I think that's important to, to recognize. The biggest difference between the two places, I think, ties to the legacy of the nationalized coal industry in the United Kingdom. If you're not familiar with that history, between in 1947, the government, central government, took over pretty much all the basic industries in the UK in order to rebuild after World War II. So the coal industry, the gas industry, the steel industry, all electric industry were all nationalized between 1947, and the coal industry stayed 19, in 1947, and the coal industry stayed nationalized between 1947 and 1994. Um, crash, crash course in history, you all may not, most of you may know this, but during 1984, there was a, the move towards privatization led to a national coal mine strike. And that's based, that was the beginning of the end of the coal industry in Wales. Eventually, the National Union of Mine Workers lost that strike. 20,000 mining jobs were lost that decade between 1980 and 1990. The most profitable mines were privatized. The mines that weren't profitable because they were publicly owned, actually stayed in public ownership. The ownership was not under the National Coal Board that had been running the mines, but got transferred to the Forestry Commission or to local councils, which is close to our county governments. Um, so what you see is a lot of property that's now controlled by Forestry Commission and county governments. And that means that people can use a democratic process to access that property and use it for um, economic regeneration. And I think that's very different than in the central Appalachian Mountains, where so much of the property is privately owned. You all probably know that uh, 2013 report from the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy that said that between 50% and 70% of the land in the state's southern coal fields is owned by absentee corporations. Um, so that's, that really limits what communities can do, what resources they have that they can access for this kind of regeneration, I think is important to keep in mind. The other thing that uh, was also striking was uh, the degree of mine reclamation in Wales and how well it was done. Um, and I can ramble on more about that, but the, um, maybe we'll save that if it comes up in the panel. I think the most important thing that I hope we do talk more about in the panel is that this mine reclamation isn't just to make things look pretty, but it's improving water quality and fixing water quality and that that is really an essential element for healthy communities, a thriving economy. You're not going to, it's very difficult to attract business if you can't drink the water. It's very difficult to convince people to raise their children in a place where you can't drink the water. Um, so figuring out ways to improve water quality, I think, is another key that, that, that we can see that came from that, that experience. And I think the other thing is that it just, it takes time. And so as, as I start to wrap up, I want to just read a sh very short quote from a woman named Victoria Winkler, who runs the Bevan Foundation in Wales, which is a, a think tank of sorts. And she, would, she said, I would say there are lessons to learn, and one of the biggest ones is that it takes a long time. There are no quick wins. 
you can possibly have some quick wins around the environment or improving a building or something, but coping with the consequences of change takes time. I think it's inevitably painful. I think it's a question of just how much pain there is. So that quote is kind of a pessimistic tone towards something that has been called an optimistic book and an optimistic project, but I think, I think it's possible to be optimistic and realistic at the same time. And I think it's important to ground our, our discussion of how to create a better future in Appalachia by looking at what other coal-dependent regions have experienced. Um, and I think this is also beyond just coal. This is talking about the process of deindustrialization. Um, I've shown this film in, in Germany where they've done the coal and the steel has shut down. You may have been following that in the news recently. Um, in Indiana, where uh, in towns where the glass plants had, had recently shut down, and they're dealing with the sim similar things. Um, and so I think it's, it's interesting to kind of reflect on that. And one thing that comes to light that I also hope we'll talk more about in the panel is that in the past, um, workers were able to form unions to balance the corporate power that was behind that industrialization and, and to you know, kind of have this system of checks and balances. And you know, if we look at particularly in West Virginia recently, um, certainly there is active labor movement. Teachers unions are certainly alive and well. Um, but, but I wonder how, what are the new systems that, that are going to uh, speak for working class communities? What are the new systems that are, that are providing checks and balances? What are the new systems that are healthy for democracy? Not just in the coal fields, but, but throughout the, the, uh, the state and the country. So I think those are all really big questions that I, I hope the book and the documentary allow us to reflect on and, and think about. And I certainly look forward to, to talking with, more of, uh, with you all more about this over the next, uh, next little bit. Thanks. So with that. <clears throat> so we're going to shift now and bring our panel actually up to this side of the room. Um, so I have a few question for our, questions for our panelists, but again, I just want to remind you all that we have plenty of time set aside for you all to ask questions too. So please be preparing those thoughts as, as we have a, a short conversation and then we want to get you guys involved. Um, so you all have met Mr. Hansel there on the end. Next to him uh, is Nicholas Stump. He's the head of reference and access services here at the WVU College of Law. And among his numerous published academic papers is working on a book titled Appalachia Reconstructed, Law, the Environment, and Systemic Regional Reform. Next to him is Katie Coyne. Katie attended the Reed College of Media and now writes for the Charleston Gazette Mail, the state's largest newspaper. Katie's currently serving as a fellow in the Report for America project, which places young journalists in newsrooms of underserved regions across the country. Beginning, and I think that's important to note, they started in Appalachia and are now expanding. Uh, Katie spent most of her first year reporting in southern West Virginia on the challenges coal communities are facing today. So please welcome our panel. So Katie, I, I actually want to start with you. Uh, Tom spent most of his time working in, in eastern Kentucky and South Wales. You've been in the southern coal fields of West Virginia. What's it like on the ground? What is it like witnessing the struggle of these communities? As, as you speak to everyday folks, what are, what are the challenges that they're facing now? Yeah, can you shut it? I'm just going to scoot it closer to you. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> OK, you guys hear me? So um, yeah, so I am with Report for America, and as Ashton pointed out, we, we started in Appalachia. So I have a coworker um, through Report for America, not the Gazette Mail, who's placed in Eastern Kentucky, who works in Harlan and Letcher and all of these different counties that we talk about. And um, I spend almost every other day just about talking to people down there. And the biggest things that come up are things that I think we take for granted as not living down there. Um, water, food, resources that I can walk to Kroger if I need to. And in MacDow County, 
there's one grocery store, and that's a big county with no public transportation. Majority of people don't own cars to drive on these roads. When it's winter, you can't get to these places. So when, what you're facing is this just wall of frustration. Um, people feel like every step that they have taken to do better for themselves has been stopped as soon as some progress is being made. Um, there's, there's activist groups that used to be really, really active and, and are out there trying to change things, but they feel like they haven't gotten any feedback from state legislators and people that, are, that could make that change, that are in the position to do so. I've done a lot of reporting on water infrastructure, um, specifically how it's failing in the entire state, but it hits hardest in southern West Virginia because when, when you talk to these people for any story, I, and I joke about this a little bit because um, I've, I've internalized it, but I have never reported a story in the last year where I haven't gotten some iteration of the quote, we kept the lights on here since, since West Virginia was created and everyone else has left us behind. Southern West Virginia built this state and we have forgotten them. And those people are feeling that every single day. And every effort that they have tried to bring to legislators, to bring to people that might have some power, gets left on the table in their eyes. Tom, you wrote in the, and I believe in the introduction, uh, if society wants to wean itself from our dependence on fossil fuels, Appalachian communities deserve to be one of the first places where we seek solutions. Can you tell me where that quote came from? Why was that a message that you felt needed to be shared? Well, some of it echoes exactly what Katie was saying, right? And it also echoes the definition of climate justice that, that I talked about earlier, a just transition that I talked about, and, and supporting work of grassroots groups that are part of the Climate Justice Alliance, that people who have historically borne an unfair share of burden, whether it's black lung, uh, whether it's water pollution, whether it's um, you know having spouses or family members that have been uh, injured in the mines, all those things are costs, and that um, specifically for in mining communities that they've borne, and that there needs to be some some sense of equality, some move towards towards retribution. So that's one. That's the was kind of the spirit, almost the gut reaction where it came from, but it also connects to. Um, a lot of the, the writing, particularly that Ron Eller did in his history, Uneven Ground, where he, in the conclusion, talks about how Appalachia is actually America, and that a lot of the same issues that are or facing nationally, you can actually sometimes see clearer in Appalachia. So I think those are those were the two motivating factors that, that led me to write that. I think there have been a lot of solutions that have been floated that haven't started to take shape just yet or haven't actually taken effect just yet. Um, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but as I watched your documentary, as I read the book, I wanted solutions. I wanted <laughs> right. you to tell me what the answer was. <laughs> and um, and so I'm, I'm glad you addressed that because it's, it's not necessarily about solutions, but um, we're searching for those. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of them that have started. Um, Tom, do you want to start with just a brief explanation of the Reclaim Act that's been floated in Congress? What, what would that piece of legislation do and allow the coal fields to do? Yeah, so the Reclaim Act is not a law. It's a proposed amendment to the 1977 Strip Mine Act that has a lot of support from grassroots groups in, in um, Appalachia, most notably a group called the Appalachian Citizens Law Center is really pushing it and has wonderful resources about the, the Reclaim Act on the web. So I'm basically quoting those resources <laughs> and cribbing things from the Appalachian Citizen Law Center. Um, but in short, what it's doing is the 1977 uh, Surface Mine Reclamation and Control Act, SMACRA, a lot of people call it, had a provision that when um, companies strip mine a land, portion of the proceeds from the mining goes into this abandoned mine lands fund, managed by the federal government, to be then paid out to lands that have not been reclaimed. Either the companies are unable to, or it was, was not reclaimed before the 1977 law. And it's fairly uh, restricted in that it's about putting the land back, um, and, and, um, and particularly for ecological use, environmental use, which is all good, as, as we've said, but a lot of grassroots 
groups are pushing and saying, well, really, we need to add economic um, use as well. So they're wanting to broaden it out. So a lot of these kind of innovations, I was reading somebody in West Virginia is growing lavender and herbs on, um, I think that was 100 days of Appalachia report on uh, strip mines or uh, growing hemp, industrial hemp on strip mines. All those kinds of things could be covered if that abandoned mine lands clause was, was expanded. So that's what's, in short, that's what the Reclaim Act is doing. And Katie, there, are there some people in, in southern West Virginia that are trying to take advantage of, of these federal dollars right now? Yeah, I mean, West Virginia gets a pretty big portion of the Abandoned Mine Lands Fund each year. Um, a lot of their, these solutions, though, uh, when you're looking at reclaimed mine lands, they're not as simple as just, we have flat land now and let's do something. When, um, when the Service Mine Reclamation Act became a thing in the 70s, there were laws in play, or there was uh, language in this that you are supposed to return the land if you were doing surface mining or mountaintop removal onto the approximate uh, original contour. That didn't happen, and you could get a variance for it, uh, and it was supposed to be limited when, when companies applied. They were supposed to have very, very thought out and, and kind of just line by line what they were going to do with this land when it, um, when it was done being mined. And uh, going back to the 80s, my, my coworker at the Gazette Mail, Ken Ward, has been reporting on this. Companies did not enter those they did not do those reclamation plans. And we are paying the price for that now as mining is stopping more and more as we're seeing less of it. There are no plans in place for a lot of these places. And what is in place are on the fly sort of solutions that are not thought out. Um, and this goes back to, I mean, the first surface or the first mountaintop removal site in West Virginia on the Kanawha County, Boone County line. They promised to build a town there. They promised to put a prison and a school and provide low-income housing for all these families that were really put out when, when the companies left. Never happened. There's a few instances, there are successes that people point to. Uh, there's Mount Olive, the correctional facility, and there's Mount View High School in Welch in McDowell County. Um, and those aren't the norm, though. Those are the exceptions that happen to be really lucky that enough people had the funding for these things. But you do have groups now that are looking at doing um, a lot of wildlife, and, and we talked agriculture. Um, the problem with that, too, is wildlife and agriculture isn't an approved uh, use of this reclaimed land. And that's supposed to be the DEP's job to enforce that, but it kind of falls in the gray of, are we going to enforce that when there's no other plans in? Let's do something with it. Um, and you've seen a lot of the, there's uh, Reclaim Appalachia and Refresh Appalachia. And uh, there's a few other ones that are kind of grassroots movements that have started in Mingo and McDowell. Um, and they are doing what they can, but it's really difficult if you don't have community buy-in. It's really difficult if you don't have local people pushing this. And WVU Extension Services is even involved in some of this stuff. But I've talked to some extension agents and, and other people who have kind of faced the reality that there's there's a lot of cultural barriers here. And if you aren't from the area and you aren't willing to sit down and listen to what these people actually want to do, you're not going to get the buy-in. And if you don't get the buy-in, the county is not going to fund it, and the county is not going to put the effort into making these projects happen. I think, I mean, there has been, in terms of these projects, a lot of focus on we could use this land yeah. for agriculture. The Lavender Farms, which is a West Virginia Public Broadcasting report, was one example. Um, West Virginia Public Broadcasting also did some reporting on trying the National Guard, the West Virginia National Guard, trying to put apple orchards on reclaimed mine lands and raise bees in these spaces. Um, it's interesting to me that we, f we focus on agriculture and not other kinds of economic development. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you've if you have heard of any other types of use for this land, I mean, what do yeah. you, what else, is, is the focus solely on agriculture? Are there other alternatives that people are discussing? There are others. I mean, um, you see a lot of these with the flattened lands. You hear a lot about building schools. Um, I think Mingo Central was built on an abandoned mine land. I'm not positive on that, but um, you, so schools, which that's kind of becoming a losing argument as we're looking at less schools here and consolidating more. Um, but business parks were a really big one for a few years in the 90s. And you, uh, right out the Boone-Lincoln County line, you have the 
Rock Creek Development Park. And that was supposed to be this really big boon of like, excuse the pun, I guess, but <laughs> um, of bringing, uh, they, they wanted a manufacturing, someone from manufacturing to come in. And that was, um, I think it was Tomlin that originally started all of that. And, and they built, they have, I've been up there, it's only like this really big empty warehouse, right? They it's only being used by the West Virginia yeah. National Guard. So right? they scrapped the plans for giving it to, I shouldn't say scrapped yet, but it looks like they're going to completely scrap it. Of um, The National Guard is the only one that has access to that land. And they're using it for training facilities for uh, firing missiles and whatever the National Guard does for uh, testing their, their off-road equipment because they have all the terrain there to train on this. And the Boone County Economic Development Authority and all these other places, I mean... They feel like they got they, they got the short end of the stick there because they had an entire regional development authority for Corridor G, which is US 119 that runs from Charleston down to Pikeville, um, Focus That was like their big project for 10 years. And then the legislature zeroed out their funding. And they lost all progress in getting anything done. And the next year, which was last year, uh, Governor Justice scrapped the plan to build an access road so people could get up there, which would have been really big if a manufacturer wanted to come. And after that happened, everyone in these counties is kind of assuming, well, that's the National Guards now. That's their space. What are we going to do with it? And of course, you talk to uh, General Hoyer and these people, and they say, well, we would love to have manufacturers there too, and we would love to have other people come in. But the reality is it's not as accessible as they want it to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The next solution that's just been floated this year, well, I think the talk started in the fall, but has has become more in focus uh, since the start of this start of this Congress in January is um, the Green New Deal. And Nick, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, tell us about what what is the Green New Deal? What kind of impact would that have on the coal fields? Absolutely. Uh, and first, I would just like to echo everyone's thanks uh, for the supporters and the organizers for the panel this evening. Um, and I am certainly personally thrilled to be uh, part of this panel. I really do look forward to the, the larger discussion. Um, I should note that my own work is mostly steeped in, in legal theory, particularly critical legal theory and critical environmental theory. Uh, and in this work, I argue that environmental law generally has failed Appalachia, and that moreover, we don't need more uh, environmental law reform within our existing system, but rather we need uh, true transformative reform beyond the system, or we need a, some sort of a transformation of our uh, political economy in order for it to be uh, deeply ecologically sustainable and more critically just. So certainly, I you know I adopt a transformative change approach, and that will color uh, you know this and my other comments this evening. So the Green New Deal um, is is fascinating, isn't it? Um, so it is a, you know, a comprehensive policy idea that has been floated around for a while now, but it really has been rejuvenated and revitalized vis-a-vis uh, -vis Representative uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her team. Um, and the basic idea of the, of the Green New Deal is that it can provide a solution to two of the biggest problems facing uh, the United States one being uh, climate change, and the second being our intertwined uh, socioeconomic crisis, um, as illustrated by uh, you know, massive wealth disparities uh, and the like. And so the basic idea of the, of the Green New Deal uh, is that within 10 years, we can completely phase out all greenhouse uh, gases, right? Um, become greenhouse gas emission zero. And that moreover, in order to do so, we can have a massive federal investment uh, in clean energy, energy jobs and, and uh, a clean infrastructure, right? So it's like the New Deal, but a green uh, New Deal this time around. So certainly it is a uh, radical uh, approach um, to the, the uh, climate crisis. Um, and also the fact that it has a jobs guarantee um, as part of the proposal uh, is important um, as, you know, per the uh, Ocasio-Cortez version of uh, the Green New Deal, um, it would claim to uh, eliminate poverty as well. So I think some of the interesting things in the Appalachian context for the Green New Deal, um, you know, is that the proposal specifically says that the Green New Deal would target um, fossil fuel 
uh, ravaged communities, uh, such as those in Appalachia, right? So part of the Green New Deal would be um, implemented in, in, in Appalachia uh, specifically. And there also is an intersectional uh, focus in the Green New Deal, um, which involves uh, compound forms of oppression, right? So it's just not achieving a, a Green New Deal uh, in a general sense. But there also is a concern with historically subordinated populations along lines of race, uh, gender, class, and so forth. So all very interesting, I think, uh, in the Appalachian context. You know, certainly I think is a proposal worth exploring. I would just add uh, from the perspective of, of, you know, some of my own scholarship that there are alternatives to the Green New Deal where there are other um, alternative development modes that could be explored in conjunction with the Green New Deal, um, right? Such as the uh, degrowth paradigm, which you know through other dimension has has been explored through uh, subsistence-based approaches and the solidarity economy. Um, and I think the solidarity economy in particular could be um, you know a useful paradigm in exploring an alternative development approach in. Uh, Central Appalachia. Among other things, it's not based in, uh, you know, perpetual capital accumulation. Um, it's not based in um, perpetual growth. Instead, the solidarity economy is based on meeting basic needs only, uh, right, within a community and in an exceedingly uh, egalitarian fashion. Um, you know, some, some specific examples of the solidarity economy would be like multi-stakeholder solar cooperatives or multi-stakeholder agricultural. Cooperative. So again, in a general sense, I think the Green New Deal is fascinating. It's definitely moving the needle on what's politically possible in terms of uh, both the global ecological crisis and the intertwined socioeconomic crisis. But I think there are other alternatives worth exploring uh, in Central Appalachia specifically. There's a thread I, that of a piece that you said that I want to throw out to Katie and Tom, but I'm just going to say quickly that um, I'm going to ask this question, and then I'm going to hope that there's a line of people at that microphone. <laughs> so please feel free to step forward now. If not, I've got lots of questions, but we would love for you to be involved. So feel free to come forward. Um, the thread that I just want to touch on a little bit and, and have Katie or Tom maybe talk about on the ground experience with is that guarantee, the job guarantee, um, and also within the Green New Deal, there is a universal basic income proposal that all Americans would not just have a job guarantee, but a guarantee of a basic level, a small, essentially stipend of monthly income. Um, I mean, <laughs> do, you, do you feel like these, these are policies that Appalachians can trust in? I think for me, that is what it comes down to is, right. maybe this sounds like a great idea, but, but is there trust in that policy? Is there trust in its ability to work? So in my experiences, trust is um, a really hard thing to build in a lot of these coal communities, right? Um, and that goes like person to person, but policy to policy and action to action. Um, when, when, you, when you talk in Southern West Virginia, and in, in probably the state as a whole, even central Appalachia as a whole, you need to make sure that you're explaining things to people in a way so they understand how it affects them. Um, and, that's, and that's not saying talking down, and that's not saying simpl simplifying things. It's making it so these people can understand whatever they're going to have to sacrifice or the changes that they're going to have to make are, are worth something in the long run. And that's probably how you should talk to everyone, in my opinion. But <laughs> when, when we talk about voting trust, um, goes back to my point before of these people have been used as experiments. Their communities, their families, their experiences have been used to experiment for these larger picture things over and over and over again. And we have failed to give them any buy-in. We have failed to give them anything in return. Um, and we criticize them for it. We, we make fun of them. People, I shouldn't say we, but people, the number one question I get on every story I report that is something negative is, well, why don't these people just move? Why don't you get out of there? And that, that, I know it always comes from people who don't know anyone in MacDow County and don't know what they're going through, but that hurts. I mean, you're asking someone to give up their culture. You're asking someone to give up everything that has built them, everything that their family has invested, their entire livelihood, and that can't be a solution. We shouldn't ask someone to give up a part of themselves to be what could be a solution for the rest of the United States. That being said, um, there, I think, is an 
a, a change in culture and being willing to open up the door to these things. In the last five years from people I've talked to, um, there's been a shift in conversation. You hear a lot more on boom and bust and less on just boom. You hear more about, um, I, I know we're at WVU and President Gee says this all the time, but diversifying the economy and doing all this. You hear more about those options, and Tom, you talked about this in your book, mm -hmm. not just looking at diversifying, but looking at transitioning. Um, and people are becoming more open to that as they are realizing the failings of the systems that exist. And they're becoming more open as they realize how those failings affect them on a day-to-day -day basis and how it's going to affect their children. And they don't want to leave, and I don't think a lot of them are going to. Well, we have population decline, but I don't think a lot of them that are passionate about staying are going to. We need to make efforts to explain in a way that that is effective, not just in these potential hypotheticals of, well, you'd be doing something for other people. Um, and be realistic about the fact that we can say solar jobs and we can say renewable energy, um, and you're not just combating an economic, an economic divide, you're combating a cultural divide. And, and figuring out, and I don't know the answer to this, I don't think anyone does, enough that if they do, I think they're lying. Um, yeah. But <laughs> figuring out how to talk about these things in a productive way that's, that's not just using people as a means to an end. Tom. And I'd like to respond to that. I agree with everything you said, but I want to provide a, just a slightly different angle on mm -hmm. it. So certainly the issue of trust that you identified is crucial. Um, and the fact that there is a window right now where people are actually actively seeking solutions. I noticed that while I was in the production of the documentary, the conversation started to shift and has continued to shift. Um, but at the same time, I just want to provide a couple real quick historic examples that show why trust is so hard to build. So the New Deal was in the 1930s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. What, if you follow the way it played out in the coalfield counties, it basically built a democratic political machine. And you had to toe that democratic line or you didn't get your food or you didn't get your relief money. You had to vote the right way and get your family to vote the right way or you were out of the New Deal. It wasn't a New Deal, right? <laughs> um, and, and then we moved to this, the next attempt, which was Johnson's War on Poverty, which he came to the Appalachia to announce. And there's actually this wonderful book that tells the whole story. Huey Perry's They'll Cut Off Your Project. And, um, and for those of you that don't know the story, the, the idea was behind the, the uh, War on Poverty, maximum participation of the poor, forming community action agencies that were made of low-income people, that were making decisions about how federal money then moved into their community. Worked really well until they started building a grocery co-op that, that competed with the local politicians grocery store. And then that was, that's the example he uses in the book, but you saw, but that was not the only example in the region. You saw a change and all of a sudden you had to have elected officials on that community action agency. So what our experience passed down through generations in the mountains has been that these big programs may work for a short period of time, but often get co-opted yeah. into an existing power structure. And so I think what we need is either checks and balances that keep that from being co-opted or being very vigilant and having a, a very clear democratic structure to control ideas like a Green New Deal or Reclaim Act, et cetera. Let's take our first question. If I could ask you to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Connor Craig. I'm a 3L. Um, I recently took a economic development and transactional lawyering class in Appalachia and one of the main issues, or a major issue that we talked about, was a concern of our Appalachian elites. Um, and generally what I mean by that is individuals in power in Appalachia who uh, would ordinarily be the ones that could make these changes come about in the region or changes that we, we may need, but routinely don't actually allow that to happen or in some cases uh, stop that, stop those changes from happening. Uh, so if each of the panelists could maybe talk about the issue of Appalachian elites and what we could do just as a general community in Appalachia to combat those uh, policies and actions. Thank you. Nick, do you want to start? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think the question of the local elite power structure uh, throughout Appalachia is certainly an interesting one. Um, the maximum feasible uh, participation of the poor provision 
um, that came about during the war on poverty is just a fantastic example um, because that was the one instance where maybe it could have been a more radical program uh, in Appalachia um, and the, you know, the elite power structure uh, essentially um, quashed it. Now, from you know, my personal perspective, from the sort of uh, work that I do, I think that in a place like Appalachia, the most important thing that we can do to um, take into account the fact that there is an entrenched power structure that's often been problematic when we've looked at uh, development models in the past um, is we can work on mobilizing and we have to investigate the question of what um, role folks can play, whether you know they're in the um, Appalachian intelligentsia, grassroots organizing, and so forth, in supporting that um, mobilizing. Um, you know, as compared, you know, we do have a very rich um, Appalachian grassroots tradition, but there's only pockets um, of that tradition in the region, right? It's not widespread as it is in you know some other places in the uh, in the country. So I think the question is, what can we do in order to um, mobilize a broader movement going forward? Maybe. Uh, mobilize a movement that's more concerned with transformative change. That's something that we're interested in going forward. Um, I think that's um, a central question, and that's how I would um, account for that, you know, uh, long-term entrenched system. Want to add anything? I'll, ju I'll just uh, go back and quote Terry Thomas from the film, where he <laughs> says, the only people who are going to save this community are the people in the community. Mm -hmm. And just build on this idea of mobilizing that lo joining local groups that are grassroots groups that you can believe in. There, are, I think, are several around this state, certainly around this region, and figuring out ways to build power through collective action is the only the only resource I know of that that has worked. It's had limited success, but it has had some success. So I would I would encourage you all to do that. So I, um, <laughs> I have that quote written on my notes right now because I was going to bring it up. Uh, so Sorry, didn't thanks, mean to Tom. steal that from you. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, to nail the point further for you guys, it's, it's local. Um, if anyone's familiar with how water districts work here, um, public service districts, there, there's tons of them in West Virginia. And my favorite story when people ask me the power of local activism, um, in McDowell County in 1989, there, and if you guys aren't familiar with McDowell, it's one of the most impoverished counties in the, na in, um, in the nation, but it is in the state. Uh, it's where the first food stamps in the United States were given out. Um, it's currently the highest, one of the highest rates of drug overdoses. It's, it's ravaged by all of this stuff, right? Um, but it's my favorite place here, so it's, it's amazing. Um, but in, the, in 1989, when there was a ton of water problems going on. The, the coal companies built all, this, all these water systems and they gave them to the town and it was in the hands of this private company that was really just, just ravaging the citizens. They were paying high rates for water they weren't getting, water that was dirty, that had twigs. Um, that's still the case in some places. But back then, this woman named Frankie Rutherford uh, decided that she had had enough. And she called, she called someone from the DEP to come or some agency to come down and look at it. And when they got there, she said no. Don't fix anything for me. I'm not going to fix this until my neighbors can get clean water, until we all can. And they, um, through talking with her neighbors, it was mostly women, which I think is really cool, but um, they formed this group called Big Creek People in Action, which was, it, they took over the water system for the entire county. They got all these systems to come together and form the MacDowell County PSD, which today uh, runs 12 different water systems in the county. There's still a few, and they're, they're swiping them up as they go. And it's one of the most effective examples of that is change. And, and that, um, that was obviously a while ago. And Frankie, I, I've never gotten to meet her. She's like one of my heroes. But she died in 2013. Um, but that was what activism looked like then. It was talking to your neighbors and, and coming together and saying, I'm not gonna change things for myself until Ashton can get something too and Nick can get something and we can all come together and fix this, at least for a little while in the best way that we can. And it's, you still, you still have those sentiments in Southern West Virginia, you hear them all the time, people fight for their neighbors. Um, they're going to fight for their neighbors and their family, but it gets discouraging sometimes when they can fight all they want and they get stomped down by someone at the legislature who's not gonna listen to them. Let's take our next question, if you'll introduce yourself. 
Sure. Hello. Thank you again. All oh, this was so engaging. Um, I'm Priya Bhaskaran, and I dropped the mic. Um, <laughs> I am a professor at the law school. Um, I'm also very short, so I'm simply going to hold this mic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you go for so, it. So um, my question actually has to do with some of the um, reclamation of the mine lands. Um, particularly, you know, in, you mentioned Reclaim Appalachia, so you do see a lot of the work being done in the southern coal fields being led by nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. um, which is not a government actor. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in Wales, who is doing this and if there are lessons that we can learn from that? Yeah, um, so I think not to go too far back in history, but it does help to understand what, what options are available. Um, in 1966, there was the Aberfan mine disaster in Wales, which for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it was kind of the equivalent of the Buffalo Creek disaster that happened here in the 70s. Um, so a coal waste pile that they call a coal tip fell on an elementary school, killed 116 children and 14 adults. As a result, there were very strict laws passed about what you could do with coal waste throughout the UK. And all of those coal waste piles were cleaned up primarily between, I guess the law was passed in 68, the disaster was 66, the law was passed in 68, all the way up through the 80s um, and even into the 90s. In fact, I was at a conference of um, ac architectural historians and they were complaining that in the UK, they have cleaned up so much that you can't tell where the mine sites are. <laughs> and, and they wanted, they wanted to preserve some of the architecture and the, the steel and, and all that sort of thing. Um, but that was all government driven. Um, some of it was the leftover funds from the coal board. So it was the legacy of this nationalized industry. Um, some of it continued, again, being government driven, I believe more under forestry. So they were actually planting trees to then that are, they were planting they were criticized somewhat for planting monocrops. They were planting pine forests that could be harvested for pulpwood and, and uh, very quick turnaround um, timber. But it did help stabilize the soil. It helped reclaim the mine sites and, um, and certainly improve the water quality. But unfortunately, it took a disaster for it to happen. But it was, it's, all, it's been almost 100% government, although I will add, not to go on for too long, but there is this interesting um, topic or tradition, I guess, of community funds happening throughout the UK and throughout Europe, I've learned, um, that when there's a large infrastructure project, whether it's highway building, um, I ran across it even with a wind farm, an industrial scale wind farm, that the corporation, in order to do it, part of their deal with the local government is they put a portion of the profits into a community fund where then there's a local group that decides how to reallocate those, those funds. And that that's very common. That happens with mine sites. That happens, I've, I saw in Wales, and with particularly with the wind farm. I follow both of those stories in, in After Coal. And to me, that can be then also used to, to reclaim. And in fact, a lot of groups are doing that. Your next question. <laughs> if you'll just introduce yourself for us. Yeah, so I'm a, <clears throat> apologies, because I'm a little sick. But um, I'm Sierra Williams. I'm a 2L here. I'm a uh, Southern Appalachian coal miner's daughter, so coal has been my life since I uh, can remember. And we're stubborn, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're stubborn, and unfortunately that makes me a cynic when I hear that the Green New Deal is going to eliminate uh, you know, fossil fuels within 10 years. So it makes me believe that West Virginia is going to be even more forgotten than it already is. Um, there are economic development yeah. studies now that are showing that while the United States economy has been uh, booming as of late, to use your wording, um, a lot of the booming is coming into cities and leaving small towns like West Virginia behind, where we're essentially dominated by those towns. There has been new legislation that's, that could be an alternative that you're looking for. It's the uh, Opportunity Zone uh, regulations that are in the TCJA. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on that, because it's more focused on uh, economic development through private enterprise. So it's through a lot of people coming in and investing money in these places. It's a place-based tax incentive, essentially. So I was wondering if that could be a utilization for those communities, because 
Uh, Southern West Virginia does have several of these zones that have been designated by Governor Justice, and I know that uh, Harlan, Kentucky, I think a couple places there have been designated as well. So I was just wondering what sort of opinion you had on their usefulness, even though they're innovative. I haven't followed that one as closely, so I may defer to, to you all. That's you. <laughs> I am uh, somewhat familiar with uh, um, that policy. I think it's certainly interesting and worth exploring. Um, I feel like we've done some research on it together at, uh, at some point in this, in this semester. Um, but I'm not uh, nearly as well acquainted with it as, as you are, so I can't speak to that in particular. But I do, but maybe a broader point that you were making is, um, you know, the Green New Deal has largely emanated from outside of Appalachia. And despite the fact that the Green New Deal um, has provisions saying that, you know, we're particularly concerned about fossil fuel ravaged communities, um, what's the effect that it's actually going to have in Appalachia if it didn't necessarily start here? I think that's a great point. And again, it goes back yeah. to issues uh, with the war on poverty. And again, that's why I think, you know, explorations of bottom-up approaches that already are existing here or could be further incubated here, such as the solidarity economy, I think are particularly um, interesting because they are alternative development modes to what we've seen in the past, which were largely um, top-down development modes, right, from, from D.C. policymakers and so forth. And so any, um, right, local-based initiatives actually start here and, and not from, um, from outside of the region, I think, are interesting. I think, oh. Go ahead. Um, Nick made a good point there too of um, focusing on what we already have. What what infrastructure for for change or policy or economic development do we have here? And the fact of the matter is, I mean, we have things in place that have been passed by our infra by our legislature in West Virginia to try and combat some of these issues. In 2014, um, we we passed and signed into law the Future Fund, which is a permanent endowment fund that's supposed to be taking a percentage of our severance tax on natural resources, so coal. But also, I think ours is just focused on natural gas because we're um, we're if, if you guys any of you follow Ken Ward's reporting, you will watch the how the natural gas industry is just repeating the mistakes of us in the past with coal. And a big fact there is we did not get the the payback that we should have gotten off of our severance taxes. Mm -hmm. So what this um, what this proposed to do is take a percentage of our severance taxes and put it in this permanent fund and just the principal amount and then use the interest that accrues on that to pay for infrastructure projects, to pay for economic development, and they left it really open so we could use this money for whatever the need was that year. Whatever the need is that we have that is the most pressing, give priority to, to environmental and, and water and all of these things. But the fact is, um, signed into law, it's in state code, and we have never put a single dollar into the fund. I think that, I apologize, I'm not supposed to be discussing, I'm a member of the <laughs> panel, but I was, I was covering the West Virginia legislature at the time, and I think that ultimately what happened, that was Jeff Kessler's yes, idea. Yeah. He was Senate president and, um, and traveled to North Dakota and based this model off of what North Dakota is doing. They had a massive gas and oil boom, and they set aside that money and actually tied it to economic development, infrastructure, and education. Ultimately, he wanted to do the same and take a cut of the severance, ga severance tax on natural gas, and he couldn't get anybody to agree to it. Um, so I believe that the final bill that's in place is actually that it's supposed to take a portion of any surplus that the legislature would have at the end of the year, and it's written in a way that is like we can put this additional surplus into the fund, but you don't necessarily have to because, of course, half of every surplus that we have every year, go year goes into our state's rainy day fund. Um, but initially, that was his plan, right? We're not going to repeat these mistakes of the yeah. past and nobody would agree to it. It took him several years to get that bill through, and ultimately he had to just Yeah, it was like from concede. 2011 to 2014, and now there's so many rules and laws that it's, uh, it's yeah. nope. <laughs> yes. Nope. Tom, I'm sorry, did you have something to add? I think it's not relevant. Let's keep the conversation <laughs> moving okay. and go to the Do you go want to introduce the yourself? Question. Sure. I'm Anne LaFosse. I'm a, uh, a professor here. I specialize in labor law. And I actually was in the UK in 1992 during the announcement of the closing of the 31 coal pits. So I changed my doctoral dissertation topic to actually what happens when there's mass economic dismissals such as that. And that's why I focused four years of my life on. So this is obviously a, a topic that's near and dear to me. Uh, I want to rephrase something that Katie said, which is, well, no one knows the answer. I think we do understand the answer in the broad sense, which is economic diversification. And 
that the problems are cultural, as you point out, and but also a polarization between government solutions and private enterprise. And this idea that somehow, because we've become ideological, we're, some of us are not allowed to like government solutions, some of us are not allowed to like private enterprise, but why aren't they both compatible? So for example, I liked what Sierra was saying. I think there, it's really important to put in and bring in um, some money from the rest of the country, but and letting them know that they should be diversif helping diversify this country, this area of the country, which has actually um, energized the United States at least since World War II, if not be probably way before that. And that that means we also have to talk about that, and we need to we need to publicize that. But that doesn't mean that um, that private enterprise can do it by itself because private enterprise, as we know, is selfish and greedy. That's part of capitalism and that we do need government solutions to keep um, things from happening like the Buffalo Creek disaster. So we do need regulations. But we also need to, a cultural change and I think also something that people were talking about was the consolidation of the schools, which is a problem that the answer shouldn't be, well, now we're consolidating schools so we shouldn't build. It's that we need not to consolidate schools, we need more schools instead of money going into, into transportation costs, and then we'd have more money going into teachers who can actually help talk to students, more time in the classroom actually having them talk about things rather than they're on a bus all day long, and then they're, not, they're losing that time in education. So I think this is something that's really important that we do need, as I think some of our panelists like Nick and um, others were saying, that. Um, we do need to um, do it from the, the ground up. We have to stop fighting between the, these, these ideological poles and realize that whatever solution helps is helpful. It doesn't matter if someone we don't like said it. It doesn't matter because even people we don't like might have good ideas and we just take a good idea and run with it regardless of whether it's, it's a private, it's coming from private enterprise and development or some government help. So I don't know if anyone, that's my comment. If anyone wants yeah. to comment on my comment, that's fine too. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, it, it reflects exactly what I started to say before. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, this idea of, of blending public and private, um, I think is a completely viable solution. And although, as you probably know, in the former mining regions of the UK, they're still struggling. It's not all happy. Um, I mean, certainly the wealth it appears much more wealthy when you drive through than, than the central Appalachian coal fields, but they still lost population. They've lost income um, as well. Um, so I don't want to say that it's all perfect, but I want to throw out one very small scale example that blends a lot of those points that you talked about, and that's the, the Dove workshop. It's, it's, portrait, it's in the film and in, and in the book, and it was um, started as an educational workshop from women who had organized as uh, auxiliary support group for the miners' strike. So they were women who were often had not been part of the cash economy, who had been just working and relying on the husband's union wage, and they realized quickly, they saw it, what was coming after the strike, that the industry was gonna decline and that they needed to become earners. And um, they saw that much more quickly than the men, by all, by all accounts, and so they, formed this group called Delice Opportunity for Voluntary Enterprise, and they were able to talk the local government into giving them an old mine office, and they started doing training courses, for primarily designed at the beginning to teach women business skills. So it was educational, but what they've done is they expanded. They realized, first of all, if we're gonna be um, primarily targeting women, we need to provide childcare, because women are the primarily the child, so they've got a nursery. They realized that people were able to pay for childcare, either through government support or through other jobs, so the nursery is actually self-supporting. Then they realized that they had community garden space, and so they have a restaurant that's self-supporting, and so doing catering as well, and, and canning. And so they've got a kind of this hybrid in this old mine office that they've completely refurbished and expanded, and it's run off of, has partial solar power, and they're running, the half of it is earning, you know, for-profit business, the nursery and the and the, um, and the restaurant, and the other half is educational and supported through uh, University of the Valley. So it's like continuing ed, adult ed courses that have kind of expanded to beyond just training women for business skills. You can learn Welsh language there, you can learn history there, you can learn art 
there, and they uh, you can get a two-year degree through there as well. Um, so it's kind of an interesting, uh, very small scale. They employ, you know, total maybe 30, 40 people. So it's not hundreds of people, but it's a way to keep this one community together, and it serves as a gathering place where people can talk about other ideas as well. Your next question. Good evening. My name is Derek Rader. Can you hear me on this? A little mm -hmm. bit Just closer to the mic. Closer. There you go. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Derek Rader. I'm a undergraduate student here at the university studying energy land management. I'm from southern West Virginia, so I've seen a lot of this firsthand. Now, you've discussed a lot about the New Deal and a lot of these community efforts, and it seems like the community efforts, efforts are very successful <laughs> in spite of you know, the, the old New Deal, which you know, scared a lot of the communities away from public assistance. How do you think the um, New Deal, I mean the Green New Deal, at least I should say, is going to um, be received by these communities if it does come into effect or if it's these sorts of communities that are going to be opposed to it? I know that ideas like socialism are definitely scary to these sorts of people, seeing the, um, I don't know what, I mean, the, uh, I don't know, th this, I'm thinking of a word here, it's not coming to me, of course, get up to the microphone. But what are some policies, you know, both free market and um, more um, nationalized that seem to have been successful in Wales and around here? What sorts of things have been successful, what hasn't? Maybe you can start with the, the question of yeah, how you think some the of those things might, yeah. might, be, uh, might be received. Yeah. So and then I we will, can kind of go on to the other parts of the question. Yeah, as far as they will be received, um, there was an editorial in the Roanoke Times uh, probably about three weeks ago, and the headline of it was uh, America's Green New Deal forgets Appalachia. And um, I think that is going to be an idea or a thought that we are going to have to face head on. And the argument there is... We've heard these ideas before. We've at least heard people talk about them. And um, what needs to be addressed is not just transitioning the industry into renewable energy or transitioning the idea and the conversation that we're having, we're having, but really, really considering the implications for coal company towns. For for these towns that were built in, let, let's talk um, Gary in MacDow County, or yeah, Gary in MacDow County. Um, it was built by U.S. Steel. It was once six different communities that came together in 19, in the 70s and became one, Gary. And Gary is still really small, and it's hard to imagine as six different places at one point. Um, and today, there's one grocery, there's one market. I sh they don't sell food. It's just drinks and stuff. Um, when you don't have the space, because all the space is just abandoned coal mines, you can literally, like, the tipple goes right over the road that you have to drive to get in, and the welcome sign is a hand-painted welcome to Gary. What does that mean for people that are living here? Um, does that mean change right away? I don't know the answers. Does that mean, does that, mean that they will one day maybe get clean water, that their, that their pipes will not be like breaking underneath their feet, literally? That, that maybe, um, and if, if the answer is yes, I don't think people really care what the means are to accomplish that. Um, with my reporting with water, I found like there was all these arguments from people in the industry that, well, citizens and Gary don't want the county to take over their water and they don't want West Virginia American water to take over their water because they like to have this community owned thing. And I think like for some people that's obviously true, but the reality is people don't care as long as the water coming out is clear if it can have like no contaminants and if it comes out, they don't care who provides it. So if we can get to that end line, and that's the struggle there though, right, is convincing them we will get to that end line, is convincing that it will be in their interest. Um, but I, I, I don't know how it's going to be received, but I imagine when you start talking renewable energy and changing culture and changing all of these conversations, you're always going to be faced with opposition, at least at first. Uh, I, I want to just wholeheartedly agree, first of all, with that the proof is in the pudding, right? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter in some ways what you call it, it's how, what the results are. Um, and second, I think what one thing that I found, particularly after I finished a, a documentary called The Electricity Ferry and I started doing these public forums in Wise County, Virginia, um, about building support for renewable energy in this place where a coal-fired power plant had just been built. And what I found is people really want to talk about alternatives, 
but they really didn't care that much about a renewable energy. A lot of what people wanted to talk about was agriculture because that's deep, it's part of a tradition. It's what people knew, it's mm -hmm. uh, knowledge that's been handed down for generations. And I think, and I think there's room particularly in the agricultural sector, to blend some of these public and private approaches. So one example that I touch on in, in the book and the film is a former coal miner named Shane Lucas in Letcher, Letcher County, Kentucky, who's become a farmer. And what's happened actually since, since the film was finished um, and the book was finished is a pretty interesting story in that he's become part of a group that started the local farmer's market, which is a pretty common thing happening around here public, uh, you know, private enterprise, but often using a public space. But in uh, that county in Kentucky, they've actually teamed up, the farmer's market has teamed up both with the SNAP program, so you can do food stamps through the farmer's market. They actually will sell breakfast burritos at the farmer's market, um, and kids that were on the free lunch program can get free breakfast burritos, so there's bringing more families in. And there's a local health care provider, Mountain Comprehensive Health Corporation that was able to use some affordable health care funds to provide prescriptions for green vegetables, particularly for diabetes patients. I think they were able to get money specifically to address diabetes, saying people need more vegetables in their diet. You can go to the doctor's office and get your prescription for green vegetables. You can deliver that prescription at the farmer's market. The farmer gives you the vegetables. The farmer takes that it's actually tokens, they've got little round tokens, back to the healthcare provider that gives them cash. And so it's a real mix of public and private and it's supporting community health, it's supporting economic transition, and it's supporting local, um, local agriculture. And I think it's really hopeful. But you need all those parts working together and, and not fighting each other. And that's sometimes a challenge in a small community. But they've been able to make it, I, you know, I should take my hat off to Valerie Eisen is a, old friend and she's really been one of the people driving that and has a good personality to bring people from different political spectrums together. And sometimes that's what it takes is a community organizer that can, and she wouldn't even call herself an organizer, but somebody that's from that place that knows how to put people together and can talk across those lines. I think that's really important. We'll take our final question. Yeah, I'm Jamie Van Ostrin. I'm a professor here at the law school teaching energy and environmental law. First of all, thanks so much for your book and your film, Tom, and Nick, thanks for your scholarship, and Katie, thanks for the great reporting that you and Ken Ward do on these issues, and Ashton, thanks for the great reporting that West Virginia Public Radio does. <laughs> anyway, we talked earlier about what can possibly be done on abandoned, abandoned mine lands, and I want everybody to be aware of House Bill 2589, which was introduced last week, the Modern Jobs Act, Mojo Act, um, anyway, it's an, it's an outgrowth of a project that Evan Hansen and our newest delegate from Mon County and I worked on over the summer with the Nature Conservancy. And it's basically to create incentives to put uh, utility scale solar on abandoned mine lands. Um, the idea is, well, we need to use these abandoned mine lands for, you know, we can reuse them. Um, secondly, they have a lot of the transmission and dis distribution infrastructure because Mines use a lot of electricity, so instead of electricity flowing to the mines, electricity would flow from the solar panels um, back into the distribution system. It also addresses a need of the new economy. Employers uh, don't really want the kind of electricity that we sell in West Virginia, which is 95% coal-fired. Mm -hmm. They want renewable electricity, and so this gives them an opportunity to do a direct uh, purchase agreement to, to buy the output from these uh, solar arrays on abandoned Mine lands. So House Bill 2589, make sure that your, uh, Evan, Evan's done a great job of getting bipartisan support. Um, who knows what the chances are. The utilities probably will not like it because we're basically going to require um, the utilities to wheel that power over their, over their grid to enable the buyer and the seller to get together. But anyway, things are happening in West Virginia. Anyway, thanks, thanks for the good panel. Does anybody want to respond? I think we'll keep an eye yeah. on that legislation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. We want to again thank our sponsors today, the WVU Humanities Center, the College of Law here at WVU, and the Reed College of Media. And we thank you all so much for joining us today. 
it's always our hope at 100 Days in Appalachia that by having these conversations, we'll encourage action within our communities and empower Appalachians to share their stories. So I hope that's something that you're taking away from this conversation today. And there, Professor Bastra said there is food in the back, so please enjoy that. Thank you all so much. And please subscribe to your local newspaper. Please, we're begging. <laughs>